What's up my producer friends, I'm David with anothermonsterproductions.com. So it's been a while since I've done any sort of walkthrough tutorials where I'm actually walking you through one of my projects, but recently I've been working on a remix that I'm pretty happy with, and it's actually for a remix contest on Metapop. If you're not familiar with Metapop, it's a really cool website where you can enter remix competitions and various other contests, and they have a pretty cool community, so I definitely recommend checking it out. I'll leave a link in the description of the video if you guys want to do that, but I really like doing these types of tutorials because for me personally, these are the types of tutorials that I wish that I had access to when I was an intermediate producer kind of struggling with various things. So this is going to be a really long tutorial. Basically what I want to do is walk you through my entire project. We're going to talk a little bit about my thought process and some ideas that you can have in order to really step up your production. We're going to take a look at some processing, sound design, and a little bit of mixing and a little bit of mastering as well. So like I said, this will be an extremely long tutorial, but if you're serious about music production and you really want to get better, I think think that this will be an extremely valuable tutorial and I really heck recommend actually watching the entire thing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a listen to the track and then we'll get straight into it. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and start from top to bottom. We'll just work our way down. We're going to go through the entire playlist and I'll kind of mention a little bit about each individual element of the track. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the kick. So actually, before I even get into the kick, uh, I want to mention something about this EQ. So this EQ was on the intro of the track, as you heard, and it was actually on my master channel. So I have this EQ here. And basically what I've done is I've automated the dry wet knob here or the mix level knob so that it's all the way off for the rest of the track and only on for the intro. And you can kind of see how it, it actually slopes down a little bit here. You probably heard it as well, but basically what this is is a radio effect. And because this track has sort of retro vibes going on with it, I just thought that a radio effect would be a really cool way to sort of begin the track. And so it was an idea that I had that I ultimately really liked. Sometimes you have these types of ideas and they end up not working at all. That's, I'd say, probably more than 50% of producing is having ideas, trying them out, deciding whether or not you like them. And I think these are the types of ideas that really separate amateurs from professionals is, you know, just thinking outside of the box and trying to think of cool ways to sort of enhance the listening experience for your listeners and just figure out a way to sort of bring the listener into the experience more. So for example, you know, this radio effect is sort of an old timey effect and it introduces that retro vibe right away and just kind of pulls you in to the story that I'm trying to tell you with this track. So um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. You know, anyone can kind of put together loops and make simple melodies and create trap beats in 30 minutes, but it takes a little bit more thought to kind of be thinking about, you know, how can I tell a story with, with my 
instrumental beat, whatever you're creating. And I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with making beats in 30 minutes because, you know, that can be a lot of fun. My main point is just that I think it's really important to think outside the box and be thinking of really cool ideas that you can do in order to take your productions to the next level. So let's keep moving on. Anyway, we've got our kick right there. It's sort of the retro vibe. And then we have our main kick here. Kind of a clicky kick. Uh, this was actually just a cymatic sample from a Tropical House sample pack that I have of theirs. And I actually think I used a, a few different samples from this sample pack. But um, what I did was I brought it in uh, an EQ, which it looks like I'm just getting rid of. Uh, I'm actually filtering out some of these lower frequencies below 27 hertz. And then I'm also adding another EQ on, which I don't know why I necessarily chose to use a dynamic EQ. But what the dynamic EQ does, if you're not familiar with it, is it works sort of like a compressor where you set a threshold and then you can cut out certain frequencies and the EQ is only going to start working whenever the, the signal audio goes above the threshold. So as long as the audio is below the threshold, it's not actually going to EQ anything out. And then as soon as it goes above, it's going to start EQing that stuff out. So it's really actually a, an extremely useful type of EQ, especially for mastering and to use on buses and stuff like that. For whatever reason, I decided to use it on this, even though it's going to be doing the exact same amount of EQing because it's literally the same sample over and over again, but whatever, I, I decided to do that. And basically my idea was to try and get rid of some of the high end on this kick. It just had a little bit too much click, a little bit too much high end for me. So you can kind of hear the difference there. All right, so let's move on to the clap and the snare. So first of all, we have this snare that I introduced into the build up section. And I did a couple things with the snare. As you can hear, I put some reverb on it. Um, it sounds pretty wet solo, but in the context of the track, I think it, it sounds pretty nice. Now, what I did here was I went into my channel settings and the original snare was actually this. So I had a lot longer tail and a lot more of like this information in here, which I really wanted a tighter sounding snare for this buildup. So I just brought the out up to about 52% and that was about perfect for the tightness of the snare that I want. So kind of a sound design trick that you guys can mess with, with your drum samples, with kicks and snares and, and really any sort of percussive sound. Now, a couple other things that I have going on, you can see these automation clips. So one, I have an EQ where the snare sample, as it goes all the way down, um, it kind of gets EQ'd out a little bit. So we can kind of listen. So you can hear how I'm filtering out all the lower frequencies so that it just has sort of like a high thin sound. And the reason why I do that, this is a very common practice for buildups and especially when in EDM music, but this is how you can create some contrast between your drop and your buildup section so that when it drops, it feels that much more impactful. And you know, these are the types of things that I highly recommend you do if you're not doing. Um, I, I'm also doing it with the kick drum, as you can probably hear. And a couple other things that I'm doing as well to kind of automate is uh, I'm automating the reverb. So it actually gets a little bit more reverb on the snare. And then I'm also automating the pitch a little bit, but not on the main snare, just on the filler snares. So it kind of goes in and adds like a, a, a riser effect. And then I decided that I wasn't quite happy with the snare sound. Um, it just didn't quite have as much body as I wanted it to. I wanted a little bit more thick mid range. And so I added this other buildup and because this is like the most generic buildup ever, luckily I was able to just find a buildup that had like the exact same pattern. And so that's what I did. I just added that on. So you can listen to it before. So that makes a huge difference in terms of just, you know, that thickening up that snare. And sometimes you can achieve this with EQ. Sometimes it's just better to grab another sample and layer it. Anyway, let's move on to the clap here. So this was actually a clap that is in one of my sample packs. I believe it's my Monster Samples 2020 Trap Edition, which you can get on my website if you're interested. But one thing that I'm actually hearing with this that I would like to do is spread it out a little bit. And you can do this. I mean, it already has some spread on the sample if I remember correctly, 
but you can grab like an ozone imager, which is a free plugin by the way, and you can stereoize it and then bring up the width a little bit. So it kind of just spreads it out and almost brings out the volume a little bit. I think that's gonna sound a lot nicer in the mix. Now, one thing that you wanna be aware of when you're doing this type of thing with any sort of stereo plugin is you just wanna test it out in mono and make sure that there's not any serious phasing issues that you're having. And you wanna make sure that it's mono compatible because there are gonna be systems where you're playing this and it is gonna be playing in mono. Some phones, for example, some club systems. So how you go about doing this is on your master channel. Go down here to this knob and just turn it all the way to the right and then that'll give you a mono sound to listen back to. Okay, so it does sound a little sort of phasey, I guess, like just a tiny bit, but what I'm doing with the stereo ozone doesn't really seem to actually make it worse. I think that's just the clap sample itself. Um, and it's not, it's not bad enough that I'd worry about it. So we'll go back to the original and yeah, I think it definitely makes a difference there. So I'm going to leave that like that. And then I actually had another clap sample layered on top. So other than that, I did have an EQ on this and basically I'm doing just a little tiny boost, um, at around 6.5 K. And then I also cut out some of this low end down here at about 257 hertz. Let's move on to the hi-hat. This is actually just a tambourine sample. And I just threw some reverb on it, nothing else. Next we have this other hi-hat, which this was actually another sample from my uh, Monster Sample 2020 Trap Edition, where the hi-hat actually had more of a shaker sort of characteristic to it. And it just, it felt like it would be perfect to create this, this kind of loop, which would just fill out the drum loop. So we'll take a listen to it. Just adds a nice little groove to the drum loop. So yeah, that makes it sound nice and kind of fills it in. We already talked about the, um, about this buildup, the snare buildup, but the other thing, I don't know why I have this on the same pattern. I, I really shouldn't but um, I also added this hi-hat here. And what I have going on with the hi-hat is first of all, an EQ. So I'm cutting out quite a bit of this low end on it. We'll take a listen with that off. And the reason for that is that I, I just had a lot of mid-range stuff going on with this track. And the hi-hat just, I mean, for one, it's kind of competing with some of that mid-range. And for two, it just felt like it fit better in the mix with just more of the high end and less of that mid-range in there. Now, the other thing that I did with this hi-hat was I added the transient processor on it. And that was because the initial transient of this hi-hat, which if you're not familiar with what a transient is, it's um, this initial hit. So let me zoom in here and kind of show you. So like this is the transient or the, the initial hit is the transient. And actually I can show you even more. Let me dive into this. So one thing that I did was I brought the S and P start back a little bit. It's at 3%. This was what it was originally. So this is the initial transient, this hit here, and it was really harsh and it wasn't quite creating quite the sound that I wanted. So sometimes you can actually get the sound that you want just by tweaking the sample a little bit, which is what I did in this case. Sometimes it's better to just pick a sample that works with it, but sometimes you can get a sample that's close enough and, you know, just kind of tweak it. So I brought, I cut off that initial transient to about here. And then I added this transient processor on it in order to get rid of a little bit more of that initial transient and create more of a longer shape. So you can mess with the attack and release in order to get that. And you can kind of see that in the shape here, how it's cutting off a little bit of that initial, but then it's bringing up the volume in this part. So it's creating more of like a flat sounding uh, symbol. 
or hi hat, I guess. So that sounded a lot better to me than the original. And next we have a riser. So we'll talk about this. Um, and actually, let me go ahead and unmute the sidechain because I do have this rooted to the sidechain. And uh, I mean, the riser, pretty basic riser. I didn't make it or anything. I just took a sample and it just sounds like this. So obviously adding the riser automatically makes the buildup much more um, full and like sound like an actual buildup, gives it a lot more energy. I also ended up using these risers on the second half of the drops, and that just adds another element of energy for the drop. It's a common thing that you'll hear a lot of times. So let's move on to the percussion loop. And this was a percussion loop from the same, the Cymatics Tropical House uh, sample pack. And this is actually, in my opinion, one of the best cases of using loops is like a top loop. And you can use it in several ways. For one, you could use it the way that I'm using it, where you just drag and drop it. Um, one thing that's nice about using loops is you can get in here and sort of chop it up a little bit easier uh, with you know your, your chop tool. You can get in there and do some cool stuff with that. Whereas if you're working with MIDI, it becomes a little bit more difficult to chop it up unless you export it to audio and then you can do it, which can actually be a really cool thing, um, which I recommend that you experiment with. But the other way that you can use the loop is to just get inspiration for your own loops. Like if you're against using loops for some reason, then you could listen to loops and kind of use that as inspiration for how you can create your own top loops. So, but in this case, this top loop just kind of added the perfect amount of uh, rhythm and texture to this drum loop. So take a listen. So yeah, that was really nice. I, I like that loop a lot. Next we have a crash. Pretty basic stuff. Uh, I think I added, um, here, we'll take a look at it. So basically all I did was I added a, a fruity delay three and you can hear that on that. And then we also have a white noise which kind of goes along with the crash. Now, a couple things with this white noise. So what I actually did, and one, one common technique that you can do a lot is you can make the white noise, essentially link it to your side chain so that it gives it sort of a pumping sensation. And that can kind of help to give you a little bit more movement in your track. So what I did here was on this particular instance, I felt like it was nice. You can't really hear that it's even really happening, um, especially with the context of the crash and with everything else that's going in the drop. It's not really noticeable. It's more of I did it as sort of like a textural thing where hopefully it just gives the drop a little bit more movement. But over here on the rest of the sweeps, I basically just kept it as is, so. And so the white noise makes a really big difference. Uh, it's really common effect in pretty much any genre of EDM that you're producing. And the reason for that is it adds a lot of energy and it also helps up take up some more space in your mix, which can ultimately help you get a, a higher perceived loudness out of your track, which is nice. So let's move on to this, which is just an impact. And the only time I used this was coming out of the verse into the build-up section. So these impacts can be a nice way of sort of transitioning from, you know, a part where it has a lot of drums into a section like that. Okay, so these over here, these effects are, I, I like doing this type of thing in order to add another layer. Essentially what I'm doing is layering this on top of the bass sounds or the synths, whatever you want to call them, in the drop section. And the idea here is kind of twofold. One, it adds an, another element of texture in your mix, and two, it can help add some um, width to your mix as well. So as you can kind of hear here, I'll play it for you.
and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but what I did, if you take a listen in context with the basses, well, here, I don't have to play them yet. I'll just tell you what I kind of did. So the basses are like spread out in the beginning. Uh, there's a Reese bass layered with another bass. And then this one is sort of more centered, this piece of Foley, to sort of help maintain the the mono compatibility there and just make it feel more centered and then these ones are spread out more wide because the synth after that is more centered and then same thing with these here these are spread out more wide to help maintain you know the integrity of the track like the the whole idea with this was you know I'm trying to get a, a, an even balance of of width with different sounds inside the mix. But these types of tricks can make a really big difference in, in your mix, in my opinion, um, to just bring it to the next level. Another thing you'll notice is that we have these volume automation clips. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a volume automation clip going up to give it more movement and more texture. And you can kind of think of this almost as like a side chain. In fact, the side chains that I do I do with automation. We can, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's just, again, if we listen to it, you can hear it. It just adds a little bit of swelling, which all these little tiny things add up and make your track a lot better in my opinion. So hopefully you can hear that a little bit, especially on this one, just, and it really complements the bass sound once we have the bass going as well. All right, so these next effects are basically just a vinyl crack and then veggies sizzling on the grill. And as you can see here, I'm actually doing a similar thing with the volume automation where, you know, I have the veggies sort of swelling up a little bit. It's not quite happening as fast, but again, it's the same concept where it's just giving some more movement to the track and it's really subtle. You're probably not going to be able to notice it, but it helps a lot, in my opinion, just add a little bit more dynamics and a little bit more movement to the track. So we can listen to like this section here. So you can hear the vinyl crack and the veggies in the background. And again, we're just adding another layer of sound, another element of texture, and it works in a similar way to what I was talking about with the white noise sweeps. Okay, cool. So let's move on to the bass. And this is where when I was actually creating the track, I mean, this is where it starts to come alive because I have a bass line that I can sort of go off of and it gives it a really nice vibe. So, and just so you know, before I even get into the bass, I'll kind of talk a little bit about my thought process and how I go about doing remixes. So if I'm doing a remix and I have access to stems, I'll bring all the stems onto the playlist. And then in some instances, I'll have an idea of like the genre that I wanna produce. In other instances, I really have no idea which direction I'm gonna go. And I just use the stems as sort of an idea of potential elements that I can use and it gives me ideas of, of ways to get creative. So for example, one thing I did with this synth was this was originally like a keyboard or like a key pattern thing that I took and I put into Harmer and basically used Harmer as like a resynthesis engine. And that was this synth here. If you're interested in hearing a little bit more about what I was doing there, I did a video on this a couple weeks ago and I'll be sure to leave a link in the description and something will pop up on the screen now if you wanna check that out. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I already have a video on that, but essentially I was able to come up with sort of a, a unique pattern that was essentially the same notes as what I was using before. And then I bounced it down to audio and kind of created different notes because it, my bass line was a little bit different than uh, what they originally had. So it, it ended up going with the bass line a little bit better. So we can kind of take a listen to that. So again, this was just sort of a unique technique that I used to help get inspiration and get ideas into kind of how to start creating something. Then I can start chopping up some of these other stems and, you know, looking into them, experimenting with the vocals, and really starting to get an idea of, of where I want to go with the track. But anyway, back to the bass line, so I'll get rid of that. So the bass line, if we can actually take a listen to this, and one of the, it's really quite a simple bass line, and the patch itself, here, we'll go into the bass, uh, I made it in Serum, and as you can see, it was just an initialized preset. I put a filter on it, and then I mapped the LFO to the cutoff, and I created sort of like a stutter effect where the bass moves from eighth notes to 16th notes. So if you take a listen, or if you take a look at the rate, check this out.
So you can hear that, what I'm doing with the rate. I'm basically automating the rate. And that is, if you look at the playlist, you can see that's what this automation clip is. And again, it's a very simple thing. The bass is super, super simple. It took like two seconds to make, but it just adds a little bit of extra interest to the listener. And then of course I have my side chain going on here. The way I do my side chain is I add a fruity balance. I've done videos on this in the past, um, but essentially I'm, I'm automating the volume on the fruity balance. And if you want to check out exactly how I do that, I'll, uh, I'll be sure to leave a link in the description for the tutorial on that. And then something will pop up on the screen now as well. So let's move on to these stems. Um, this one was, it was sort of like a background, like vocal chop type stem. And I think it maybe had some other stuff, but in this case, it sounds like this. So I chopped it up and it sounds like I added some delay onto it. Let's take a look. Yeah, so all I did was I added a Fruity Delay 3 on that. And then I have the lead vocal. Let's take a listen to this. When you're in the back of my love, all you got... So one thing I did with the, the vocal here was I, I liked the concept um, in the original. By the way, I'll be sure to leave a link in, in the description to the original if you guys want to check that out as well, like the original track. But um, the original had more of like a dry sounding vocal. And I, I thought this might sound cool to just add reverb. And then I did sort of a, a delay or a reverb automation clip here where I increased the wet quite a bit. So in these spaces, I just brought up more reverb. And instead of going crazy with like delays and other effects on the vocals, I thought it would sound good just keeping it pretty minimal, but just adding a little bit of reverb. And it actually worked out really well, uh, in my opinion. So especially with everything else, the reverb is subtle enough in this space where it's not, you know, making the vocals sound muddy or anything like that, which can be an issue. Uh, some vocals sound better with reverb than others. And especially you got to be careful depending on what kind of reverb you're adding onto it and how big the room size is. You know, there's a lot of elements within reverbs that can, that can make it sound good or bad. Um, but in this case, I really liked it. When you're in the back of my love so moving on to this, this was just another vocal chop, which was basically the same thing as this. It just, uh, I think I added probably like, hold on. Yeah, so I added quite a bit of effects. I added uh, a radio effect, added some reverb, I added a delay three, and then I added this M auto pitch with the formant shift, which is kind of what gives it that chip monkey effect. Um, so that's something I do a lot when I'm messing with vocals and, you know, experimenting with at really a bunch of different elements. Anytime I'm doing sort of like a background textural, like one shot type thing, like kind of like what I'm doing here, then I like experimenting with that and seeing what I can come up with. But I did it here at the beginning and then also I used it for this too. And you can't really hear it. It's kind of just more of, you know, another background textural thing that just adds a little bit something to the mix. When you're in the back of my love, all you got to do is slow it down. Ooh, you got a hunch you know now. So you can kind of hear it there. Let's move on to the reverse vocal. And how you make the reverse vocal, for anyone who's not familiar, is you basically isolate the original hit of the vocal that you want to be the reverse. So like this initial hit right here, I would just chop it and then take it to a place in the playlist where there's nothing else playing. I would add a reverb on it bring up the wet, make it super long reverb tail, bounce it down, bring the reverb tail in and then reverse it. So this is the reverb tail and then I have it reversed so that now it's swelling up. And so that is a really, really cool effect that is used uh, in pretty much any EDM track that features a vocal is gonna have some sort of reverse effect. And it can be a really cool way to enhance your buildups as well. Like for example, I added it onto this part of the buildup. We can take a listen to that real quick. So hopefully you're able to hear that. Then we have the vocal chops, um, nothing else going there. But the vocal chops I introduced in the drop section and originally when I created this drop, I was kind of thinking more of like a disco where, you know, we have the original bass and then it's like a vocal chop, but it's pretty minimal. Uh, and then 
it ended up turning more into like a future house type track overall, I guess. But the vocal chops didn't really stand out quite as much as I wanted to on their own to like carry the drop. So that's why I ended up layering a bunch of stuff on top of it. But we'll take a listen to the vocal chops. Anyway, pretty simple chops. All I did was I added them into Slice X and then use Slice X to chop it up. Again, I've got videos on my channel on this, so I'll try and leave a link in the description and have something pop up on the screen now. Next, we have the synth, which I actually haven't muted here, but we do have it here. So, um, yeah, so this is the pattern that I talked about where I was basically doing resynthesis inside of Harmer. I pretty much just use Harmer to create a different synth sound and then maintain the same pattern and notes and stuff. Next, we have a horn sample, and this was actually a, a stem that had multiple things on it. So I had the horn on it, which I added some delay onto, and then you, uh, you we also have these sounds here. And, you know, these types of background elements, you know, they add a lot, they're, they're really cool. And one cool thing that I did with this, this little, ooh, I added a delay, the Fruity Delay 3, and then I automated the tone knob in order to get the delay to go sort of like filter up and then filter back down. So you can kind of hear that here. So again, another sort of very simple technique that you're probably not going to really notice, but these are, again, the types of things that you can add to your productions to just bring them to the next level, right? So let's move on to the guitar. Um, this is just a another stem that I chopped up. And then we also have this guitar hit here, which this one I did do quite a bit of processing to, I believe. So I added some delay. Uh, some serum effects, which have flanger, phaser, and reverb. And then I added the M auto pitch. So I brought the format shift all the way up in octave, which makes a pretty big difference. And then I added a bad tape for some retro vibes. And the last thing that I did was I added this fruity convolver. And what you can actually do with this plugin is create your own custom reverbs. And I did a video on this last week. So if you want to check that video out, I'll be sure to leave a link in the description and something will pop up on the screen now as well. But you can get some really, really cool effects with this plugin. So I was kind of experimenting with that on this sound as well. So that sounds like this. Here, let me actually go over here to where it's just solo. And you can kind of hear the bad tape on there with like the, the super gritty and like sort of wobbly in and out of tune. Again, those types of things, you know, very, very subtle, but it makes a huge difference in terms of just making things sound more organic and more textural and just cooler. Next, we have this keys, which this is literally the same thing as the other uh, synth pattern up here. The only difference is I think I brought it up an octave. And it sounds like I have the volume turned down a little bit too, so it's kind of a little bit quieter. Uh, let's move on to the drop synths. So I have a couple layers going on here. So first of all, we'll kind of move through this. The first drop synth layer, I'll just do it all kind of at the same time. So I have this respace sound, which I made. And here, I'll just show you real quick. So this is what this looks like. It's very simple to make. Basically, you take a sawtooth wave and you just add two voices. That spreads it out and makes it really wide. And then what I did here was I automated uh, the LFO to the level, which gives it sort of the swelling effect. And then I also added a sub bass in order to give some actual bass there. But the problem with this bass that I was running into was that it was too, too like wide to spread out. So I had to layer this base on top. Well, I didn't have to, but I, I experimented with various things. And I ended up layering this base on top of that base to kind of make it come together and sound a little bit more mono. And then again, if you remember along with this effects up here, uh, this one was in, well, it wasn't in a mono, but it was more 
uh, centered. And by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier, but I do have a sample pack that you can download in the description of this video where it's, it's essentially a hundred free Foley and percussion samples. So if you're looking for some Foley and percussion and stuff, um, I definitely recommend downloading that sample pack. It's free in the description. Uh, and you will have to enter your email address and then that'll put you on my mailing list, but you can unsubscribe at any time. So let's take a listen to this. Here, I'll listen to this stuff. So hopefully you can kind of hear that in a new way with just those layers together, um, where it just, it helps fill out the space a little bit. And if you're listening on headphones that have a good stereo field, you'll be able to kind of hear um, the difference between the Foley, how it's kind of spreading out, and then more mono. Now this brass sound here, let's see if I can find that. So that was this patch here, which was just a preset that I found. And then I ended up duplicating it and bringing it down an octave and turning down the volume a little bit. And then the duplicated layer, I spread out. I think I added a dimension expander onto it in order to spread it out. And that you can add the dimension expander inside the effects section. So um, what I did with this one, as you can see, yeah, I just added the hyper dimension. So it's called the hyper, hyper dimension. And anyway, that gives it another layer that's kind of more spread out to give it a wider sound. So we'll listen to this by itself. <laughs> So that does help give it a little bit more width. Uh, now that I'm listening to it, it doesn't really do quite as much as I sort of would expect it to do, but it still sounds good and it adds another layer of sound as well, which kind of helps tie in the bass sound into this sound and then also ultimately into the other synth sound. And by the way, that's another thing that you guys need to be aware of is that part of you know having a basic understanding of sound design can really help with your mixing in terms of finding sounds that kind of fit together. And you can do this with EQ and you can do this with just, you know, tweaking sounds within Serum or whatever synth you're using it. Uh, you can do this with various other post-processing as well, other than just EQ. But if you know what you're doing, you can really make some different sounding synths fit together. And a good example of this is I actually have a, a lesson student who one thing that he would do when he was first starting out and when he was still like super beginner is he would find like a bass sound of some sort, but then he'd place it in the wrong octave. So there are a couple instances where, you know, he'd have one bass sound which sounded really good and then the other one would be an octave too high. So that's something that you need to be aware of, especially if you're a beginner, make sure that you're experimenting with different octaves and make sure that whatever sounds, synths, basses that you're using, you're placing them in the correct octave to go with everything else in your track. And the last thing that I wanna talk about here is the pad. So this pad is actually the same as this pad here, um, but essentially what this is, is another sound that I made in Serum a while back. And this is actually like one of my favorite sounds I've ever made. It's very simple, we'll take a listen. And you can probably hear, I think I probably added some bad tape on it. Let's see if I can find this. Yeah, so I've got an EQ cutting out some of the lower frequencies. I've got a bad tape giving it a little bit more wobble. And then you've also got the color bringing the sound up a little bit brighter. And then you have a reverb in order to make it uh, nice and wet. So in this case, I ended up using the reverb. I've used reverb and I've used no, no reverb, but Anytime I have any sort of like retro or lo-fi beat that I'm working on, I pretty much always experiment with this uh, pad sound that I created. I just, for whatever reason, love this sound. So we'll take a look at it just for anyone who likes the sound as much as I do and is interested. Um, it's a Boeing organ and it's probably pretty simple to make. I think I did a little bit of wobble effect on the find. And then, so basically you take an LFO and you map it to the cutoff. You add a filter, it's just the MG low. Don't have any effects on it at all. And I'm not gonna go through every stage that I did, but if you're curious, you can pause the video and try and copy what I did here. 
Alrighty, so we just went through everything in this entire project from top to bottom. Originally, I was planning on going into a little bit more depth into mixing and then also talking about the mastering as well. But this video has already gone on for so long that I want to go ahead and wrap things up here and then I'll do a separate mastering video some other time. If you guys did like the video, please be sure to hit the like button. One thumbs up means you thought the video was amazing. Also, if you like what I'm doing on the channel and want to see more of it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you're brand new to production or if you're struggling with anything production related, I do offer one on one private lessons, which you can sign up for on my website. So I'll be sure to leave a link in the description of this video for that as well. And I will see you guys in the next video.